So in this lesson, we are going to look at the Potsdam Conference, which took place right at the end of the Second World War. Uh, it took place in the suburb of Potsdam, uh, outside Berlin, between July and August of 1945. Well, Roosevelt, if you remember, he was the American president during the Yalta Conference. He had died and the vice president, Truman, had became president in April 1945. Now, Truman was very different in temperament and in outlook, his personality and his beliefs. He was very different from Roosevelt. He had no particular experience in international politics, so he was much less diplomatic. He basically said what he thought, he said what he believed, and wasn't concerned about whether that would be insulting or too direct or not diplomatic. He essentially said what he thought. So very different from Roosevelt, who was anxious to maintain a spirit of international cooperation. Truman took a much tougher line with the Soviet Union. Now, Truman had seen what had happened after the Yalta Conference. It certainly did not seem that de democracy was taking place within Poland. And he spoke very directly to, if you see this gentleman's picture in the bottom left, this is Molotov, the Soviet foreign minister. And Truman spoke to him very directly, uh, didn't listen to Molotov's excuses, just very direct. I insist you allow free elections in Poland. As they just interrupted, shouted down Molotov when Molotov was trying to give excuses about this. Well, Molotov was uh, very insulted. I've never been talked to like that in my life, he said to Truman. Who, and these are the real words of Truman and Molotov, by the way. I'm not making these up. Uh, Truman replied, carry out your agreements and you won't get talked to like that. So very, very direct, very different from Roosevelt. So the Potsdam Conference itself, as we say, took place at the suburb of Potsdam outside East Berlin. Germany had been defeated by this stage and it took place between July and August of 1945. So right towards the end of the war, up to the defeat of Japan. Roosevelt, as we say, had died in April of 1945 and been replaced by the Vice President Truman, who took a much tougher line with the Soviets. Churchill, part way through the Potsdam Conference, he lost the elections in Britain and was replaced by Attlee. So a couple of changes there. Stalin obviously didn't need to worry about elections and he was present at both conferences. Truman, at the Potsdam Conference, he told Stalin that the United States had developed the atomic bomb, the powerful new superweapon, the atomic bomb. And again, sorry, these are not the real words this time. These are just me paraphrasing. So he basically told Stalin that the United States had developed and successfully tested a supremely powerful new, new weapon, the atomic bomb. Uh, but it's definitely not the real words of Stalin. But I'm just trying to convey Stalin was didn't seem impressed and he didn't seem surprised. He didn't seem surprised because he wasn't surprised. Stalin uh, actually had Soviet spies working in the Manhattan Project, um, working on the development of the atomic bomb. So Stalin actually already knew about the atomic bomb. Here's a statement by Churchill. So obviously it's, it's Churchill's viewpoint, it's Churchill's bias, but what, this is what he says. Truman was a changed man. He, Churchill's talking about after Truman gets news of the successful atomic bomb test. He told the Russians where they get on and off and generally bossed the whole meeting. So according to Churchill, he says that news of the atomic bomb uh, made Truman very confident and very bossy at the Potsdam conference. Again, this would play in with Truman being very direct, uh, not, not terribly dip diplomatic. So what was agreed at Potsdam? It was agreed that German reparations would be paid. Each country, if you remember, there were four zones occupied by France, Britain, the United States and the Soviet Union. Each country would take reparations from its own zone. In fact, the three Western powers didn't really take any reparations from their zone. They were anxious not to repeat the mistakes of World War I. The Soviets did, however, take a lot of industrial equipment, especially from the Soviet-occupied zone of Germany. The German and Polish borders were agreed along the River Oder and Nisa. 
and it was agreed to completely remove the Nazi party from every aspect of German life. There were, however, disagreements at Potsdam. The Soviet Union wanted some control of the Ruhr. You may remember the Ruhr as being the area occupied by French and Belgian troops back in 1923. Well, why did they do that then? Because the Ruhr was a rich industrial area of Germany. And that's why the Soviet Union wanted some control of the Ruhr. They wanted some control of this rich industrial area of Germany. This was rejected by the United States. It wasn't in the Soviet zone. The Soviet Union also wanted a share in the occupation of Japan after the war finished. And Truman again rejected this. He didn't want the Soviet Union to expand its sphere of influence any more than it already had. The United States and Britain wanted a greater say in Eastern Europe. Obviously, that was essentially in the control of the Soviet Union and under the Red Army. And Stalin rejected this as well. Now you're going to listen to the famous Iron Curtain speech, which was made by Winston Churchill in America, at Fulton, Missouri in America, in March of 1946. As you listen to Churchill's speech and read through the words, I want you to consider these things. What is Churchill saying about Eastern Europe? What's he saying is happening or has happened to Eastern Europe? What does he say, especially about the causes of World War II? Um, he's basically giving a warning in his speech. And what's he warning about, do you think? And how do you think Churchill's speech could contribute to the Cold War? How could Churchill's speech increase the suspicion, the hostility between the democratic West and the Soviet Union? So here we go. Read and listen. From Stettin in the Baltic to Trieste in the Adriatic, an iron curtain has descended across the continent. Behind that line lie all the capitals of the ancient states of Central and Eastern Europe. Warsaw, Berlin, Prague, Vienna, Budapest, Belgrade, Bucharest, and Sofia. All these famous cities and the populations around them lie in what I must call the Soviet sphere. And all our subjects, in one form or another, not only to Soviet influence, but to a very high and in some cases increasing measure of control from, uh, from Moscow. There never was a war in his easier to prevent by timely action than the one which had just desolated such great areas of the globe. It could have been prevented, in my belief, without the firing of a single shot. And Germany might be powerful, prosperous, and honored today. But no one would listen. And one by one, we were all sucked into the awful whirlpool. Surely, ladies and gentlemen, I put it to you, surely we must not let that happen again. <laughs> OK, so I hope you've made some notes on the areas of agreement and disagreement at Potsdam and the different attitude of Truman at the conference. And also you've made some notes on Churchill's Iron Curtain speech as well. So good luck with the quiz also.